I want to make sure that at least one person can can see something that I helped create and say, man, that's that's something I've been waiting to see. That's super important to be able to give to someone because I wanted that when I was 10 years old and I, re I never got it. So I should give that to someone else. How did you start loving this like weird, stupid, crazy, amazing, dumb, glorious thing? I started when I was 10 years old. My mother was dating this gentleman who said, oh, we're going to go to my friend's house. We're going to watch some wrestling. And my brother and I were like, what? I uh, we went and then I saw The Undertaker and I was like, blown away. Uh, I am a nerd. Uh, so I just saw The Undertaker as being a comic book character. So it was really easy for me to sort of connect the dots and said, this is something I should enjoy and I should like. And then I was 10. So uh, I was really coming to terms with my sexuality and I met Sean. Well, I didn't meet him, but I saw Shawn Michaels on TV wow. and it kind of solidified everything for me. Found myself really gravitating more towards uh, things that the women were doing. I found that a little bit more interesting uh, because it was a little bit more than like punch, punch, bang, bang. And as an adult, I, I stuck watching it for a while. Got back into independent wrestling, I'd say six or seven years ago. Yeah, I just saw an opportunity to, to be involved with independent wrestling because I was doing a podcast and I said, sure, let me go for it. And it's turned into this weird thing where I'm like a part of wrestling. Uh, but to me, I'm just a mark that just likes wrestling in general. It's a little weird to like be able to say that, oh yeah, I thought of the concept of that promo and I thought of the concept of that graphic and like I booked this match and it's kind of like 10 year old me is living a, a dream that I never realized uh, I wanted. So it's pretty amazing. One of the reasons why I think this new era of, uh, of cause we've always been here, even if they didn't treat us like we were, we were always here. Mm -hmm. but this, this new era of like queer creators and folks coming in and really um, finding the similarities between wrestling and ballroom and wrestling and drag. Um, and I know that's something that you've talked about a lot as well that, that you found really interesting. Yeah, I remember actually, so I used to work for a company uh, formerly called Capital Wrestling. I think it's called Catalyst Wrestling now. And I remember sitting in the back with a bunch of the, the boys or whatever, and they were they were doing something. And I, I said to them, I was like, oh, have you ever watched Paris is Burning? Uh, and they were like, I don't know what that is. And I was like, you should watch it. I was like, you should also learn how to sew. These are all really important things because at the end of the day, like the one of the biggest correlations between the two is the idea of presenting your character in five seconds or less, right? So when you come out as a drag performer, if I don't get you, I don't get you. You need to really go kind of like balls to the walls immediately. And I think wrestling is like that too. You automatically need to sell your character to me uh, because if I don't get it, then what's the point? What am I watching? Because everyone's a good wrestler. So what else do you have besides that? Because I think a lot of people forget about how your character and your pageantry is is is, a, is probably the biggest part of your character. Even when talking about queer performers in, in the world of wrestling, it's one of the reasons why, you know, people are gonna get mad, but queer performers and women and gender non-conforming people to me are just better at it uh, because they don't get to rely on white mediocrity and just be a good wrestler in black tights. They have to be more every single time. How many examples of a basic woman can you think of there in wrestling? Because there's not many. How many examples of a basic queer wrestler can you think of in wrestling? Because there's not many. Because we always have to be above and beyond than our white counterparts. Someone gets mad at that, someone gets mad at that, they'll live. It's okay, it's a PP, it's a personal problem of theirs. The best thing about wrestling is the glamour, is the glitz, is the pageantry, and we just get it. It seems like there's been an, a recent explosion of like these really big out and proud, we're here, we're queer, we're kicking your ass shows. Have there been more of a crowd where you've seen more out and open gay folks before, or queer folks that you haven't necessarily seen before? Oh yeah, like the, even the response on like Twitter, like hearing as many people possible say like, hey, I've never been to a show like this. I've never seen wrestlers that look like me. Me, that remind me of me and my friends and my family like that's incredible I also am very particular about the shows that I do go to mm -hmm. uh, I do not go to shows that don't have black people on your if it's not on your poster not going to it uh, black people gender nonconforming women queer people not going to your show because uh, I don't feel safe at those shows I don't feel mm -hmm. comfortable at those shows it's really incredible because I remember going to my first independent shows and just hearing less than pleasant chants uh, that made me super uncomfortable and made me want to get up and leave. And now if anyone even starts it, 
it is stopped immediately because people realize that A, we're grownups now. Uh, <laughs> let's not do that. Wrestling is so diverse and big that it should be catering to everyone and it really should be a safe space. How did you make the decision to go from being a fan to being a promoter and getting more involved in the business? I did not want to. <laughs> Doing a podcast specifically for a wrestling company was already really kind of uh, time consuming and, and I, I always was worried about my boundaries and stuff like that, you know, but through that podcast, that's where I met Envy Young. Uh, and then that's, he, he met Lynn Fraley. MV kept discussing with me certain things that like he wanted to do and I would just give him examples. And then as I kept giving more examples and as I kept saying things like the posters and the match cards and the promos, and I kept thinking to myself, I do this all day at home where I like, create these stories and I create these uh, graphics and I create these ideas. Why wouldn't I want to take that chance in this company that so I get to create these worlds and I'm just like, hey, I actually have the opportunity here to do the show that I want to go to. And hopefully because it's a show I want to go to, other people want to go to. Uh, because I want to see the people in that ring that look like me. I want to see drag performances. I want to see queer performers wrestling with their straight counterparts who get all these great bookings to showcase that they can do the exact same thing. Even if it's for a year, even if it's for five years, uh, I want to make sure that at least one person can, can see something that I helped create and say, man, that's, that's something I've been waiting to see. Um, and I realized that was really important. It doesn't matter if I'm tired, but that's super important to be able to give to someone because I wanted that when I was 10 years old and I, re I never got it. So I should give that to someone else. Who do you think um, are some performers right now that are really just like knocking your socks off and that you don't understand why they aren't a household name? Billy Dixon. The kid can talk, uh, the kid can wrestle, uh, the kid can, can book. Um, and one of the reasons he doesn't get booked is because he's not a cute, uh, total, I don't know, idea of what a queer wrestler should be, mm. which is like white, adorable, and cute. <laughs> and he's none of the, well, I mean, he's adorable, but like he's, he's, he's out of the norm for them. So they don't know where to place him because, you know, there, there are certain people who always get booked and it's no shame, nothing towards them. Uh, but they don't look like Billy. Uh, and I think Billy has the talent that uh, most people are actually looking for. Uh, they're just too scared to actually work with someone who's a little bit more out of the box. I think Still Life with Apricots and Pears, first of all, what is that name? It's amazing. They're one of the most beautiful specimens in, in professional wrestling and they literally create art. Is there anything that you're just like, you're dying to talk about we didn't touch on and you really want to make sure that you get in there? You know what? I really want to get into actually uh, what's happening right now with the pandemic. Overall in a world, we're in a really shitty situation, right? But like in wrestling, uh, we have this incredible opportunity to create really, really good content. You have this opportunity to be creative. That's the whole point of being a wrestler, right? Uh, so I'm just, I'm confused as to why all of these companies are continuously running shows back and back and back and back, not allowing people to quarantine, uh, when you actually can do creative things right now. Billy Dixon has Paris his bumping, which is a no ring death match show that was recorded in one day. Like everyone took COVID tests, like it, you know, it, it, the safest way you can do it. We have a show that's on IWTV called The Wrestlers Take Manhattan, uh, which is a fully cinematic show recorded over several different days and every single person had a test. You know, all, I was wearing a mask, the crew was wearing a mask. Right now is the time to, to be as safe as humanly possible, but to utilize your creative juices. This is the perfect time to allow wrestling to evolve. What do you have behind that brain? Because there's so many outlets right now for you to come up with some really cool shit. I want wrestling to be the coolest thing in the world. And right now we actually have the means to be able to make it cooler. If you just tease your head, use your creativity a little bit more. I've been in, into wrestling my whole life. It, there was no way to be like a boy 
in the like 90s that wasn't into it. So it right. was just a cultural ubiquity at the time. And so I had to find my way in and my way in was, was like China and Lita. Between The Undertaker being spoopy and reminding people of Mortal Kombat and comic books, and then China just being China, like those are feel like the two big queer gateway drugs. Oh, for, totally. For, for, for getting into wrestling totally. during the Attitude Era. Because that's yes. absolutely what it was for me. It was seeing China be a hoss and throw dudes around. And then it was watching The Undertaker on some straight up Mortal Kombat stuff. I mean, he was magical. He was a magical person. He, like when you watched him, you felt like you were watching like a fantasy. He, did, yes. he, was, he had magic powers like it was not like a wrestling is fake moment it was like this is magic you are a magic person from another world it was it was incredible so at what point did you decide to go from being a wrestling fan to being more involved in the business i i was working for oxygen.com which which was before it was a true crime tv channel and so they wanted writing about like empowered women and i was like well i watch a lot of pro wrestling there's a lot of really cool feminist stories in pro wrestling. So I started writing about pro wrestling. I interviewed Kimberly, I interviewed Mia Yim. And then I realized that there just weren't a lot of people covering pro wrestling from a sort of art critical point of view. They were covering it from a ratings perspective, from a sports perspective. I realized if I took it seriously, I could I could really do something with that. If I took it seriously as an art form, I could do something with that. Kind of simultaneously, I was, I you know, I've been DJing in New York's drag scene as DJ Accident Report for 12, 13 years at this point. And so all my friends are drag performers. All my friends are, are some kind of nightlife creature. I was having these, these parties for every pay-per-view after the WWE Network came out and all these drag queens were coming and they were like, what the fuck are you watching? What is this? And eventually Jordan, Gorsenio, Jordan, whatever you want to call him, was like, this is the funniest thing ever. A bunch of drag queens watching pro wrestling. Let's make a TV show out of it. And so we filmed the first episode, me and Ariel and Berica, who had been like a performance trio for many years at that point. The first video went viral this, that day. From there, we were just like, okay, this is like a real thing. People really need this. And it became obvious in the same way that I felt that wrestling wasn't being taken seriously as an art form. It was. It also became clear that wrestling wasn't being taken seriously as a queer art form. And over the past, you know, four years we've been doing our show, There's. it's just turned into a whole movement. The entire LGBTQ wrestling movement is the LGBT shows are doing better than every other kind of show almost. That's not on television, obviously. Someone asked me like, oh, what's it like to be a fan at this moment in wrestling? And I was like, I... I am not a fan anymore. I'm an employee of this industry. And that does take a little bit of the magic out of it. I also still like, it is, it's in my heart. Yeah, I love wrestling. I've loved wrestling forever. When I moved to LA from Seattle, the first thing I did was I want a group of people who are cool, that are like comedy people, funny people, performing people who like wrestling because there's a bunch of us. But I want people who aren't going to be the worst people. And right. so I started my own, um, I started my own Facebook group. That's how, like, that's where the name Tights and Fights came from and all that uh -huh. stuff. Because I was like, I need a place where it can be me and cool people talking about this thing that we love. I don't want it to have to be an argument. I don't want it to have to be a fight. I just right. want to go like the thing I like. And that for me is one of, I think, as an audience member, as a longtime audience member, because we've always been around, is one of the most refreshing things about what is happening right now. And one thing that you were definitely on the vanguard of, being able to watch it without an asterisk you right. don't realize how much that asterisk weighs on you. And as someone who went from being a fan to watching it now, asterisk-free, uh, uh, great, wonderful, awesome shows and uh, performers and creators that you think are really kind of at the forefront of what's happening right now. Effie is just like one of my favorite people in the whole world. And I think he has like the most pure heart and just wants to bring like queer empowerment to wrestling. I think. Billy Dixon, who, who you've talked to, is is one of the most articulate and intelligent people in art, let alone wrestling. I think he's he's one of the he's going to be like a, a major creative force in the world. Sonny Kiss, I, I he's my favorite living wrestler. Every single match she's in, I, I could cry because if there were someone like that when I was a kid, I couldn't imagine the emotions I would have had for some, seeing someone that brave and beautiful and strong because all of our lives we were told that we were these feeble, uh, uh, fragile, pathetic creatures. And, and to see someone who's femme and black and so powerful and graceful and funny and cheerful, it's, it's just so moving to me. Dan Housen and Ali Cat. I mean, Ali's 
uh, LGBT. I mean, Dan Housen's just a demon, so I guess, <laughs> what is a, a demon sexuality? Um, you know, like those, they're really amazing and innovative and creative people who are doing really interesting character work and doing really interesting things with the art form. But is there anything that you were working on or that we didn't get a chance to talk about that you really want to make sure that we touch on? We, we haven't been able to film because of you know, the world being in a perpetual nightmare crisis. So we're doing this podcast. It's called Nobody's Saying Hello. We interview people from nightlife, from pro wrestling, from fringe culture. I, I would like wrestling people to start listening to it because then they can learn about how similar drag is in art form. And I wish drag people could listen to it because then they would learn how similar wrestling is in art, art form. It's not even similarities. In my opinion, it's the exact same art form. And so to do these interviews kind of side by side with each other has just been really like wonderful and amazing. So I never, I had never had any intention of like becoming a wrestler. Like I was, you know, working as like a freelance graphic designer and like artist and stuff like that. So I was like really involved with the art scene in Philadelphia. I had some solo shows and stuff like that. By chance, I ended up meeting Mike Quackenbush. Um, he had done Ignite Philly, which is kind of like our local TED Talk kind of thing. So he did one of those and then I met him through that. And then he invited a bunch of us who like came to the talk to like do a free workshop. Um, at the Wrestle Factory. So I did that and I was just like, cool, I just wanna like run the ropes or like, you know, touch the mat, do <laughs> just do that. And then it, it went better than I thought. He invited us to do like a class, like a seven week class. And I wasn't gonna do it, but then like my partner at the time was like, you love wrestling, like give it a shot, why not? You know, there were 16 people that started and I think eight people that finished and maybe like four of us were able to like move on, like graduate. It just kind of happened from there. And then, you know, I started rearranging my life. I kind of pushed the art stuff aside and just focused on being a wrestler. Who is still life with apricots and pears? Like, who are you? Like, how do you oh. sum up? Who is still life for those who don't know who need to That's know? a complicated question. So yeah, my name is still life with apricots and pears. I'm um, a professional wrestler. Uh, my pronouns are they and them, non-binary. Um, I am a painting, so my character was created by an artist, um, and then I have since evolved that theme over time to kind of make it more my own, but yeah, that's still life. <laughs> How were you able to find the balance where you, where you could connect both of these passions of yours, art and wrestling? I think just being used to looking for like, um, inspiration and like sketching and creating a like a design process or an artistic process and applying all those like philosophies towards being a performer and creating a character and creating a narrative when I was an artist and a designer I had all these really really like rigid goals of like you know I need X amount of Twitter followers by this time or, or something like that getting to start over with something totally new as being a wrestler like I don't I don't really do that like I just kind of want to say yes to everything and just kind of like go with the flow. And I feel like this has made me, I'm much more of a successful wrestler than I ever was as like an artist. So I think that is like very freeing for me. And um, I think that's helped me a lot. So, so one thing that we've talked about, uh, I've talked about with some of uh, the other performers and people that we've had on um, is the concept of intergender wrestling. And, and particularly as you are someone who is gender non-conforming, um, mm -hmm. your pronouns are they, them, uh, about the concept of intergender wrestling um, or gendered wrestling as, as a whole and how that affects you as a performer. I mean, I'm to obviously totally supportive of intergender wrestling. It's kind of where I trained. It was it was totally um, intergender. Like it was never really a, a concept that we talked about much. It was just, that's just the way it is. So that's just kind of what my expectations are is I never think twice about it. And I mean, every match I'm in is an intergender match. So <laughs> it's like, it's literally all I know. Even about the concept of having gendered matches, do you feel like that is something that as an art form wrestling should be holding on to so dearly or maybe is the concept of gendering matches something that the art form can start to let go of i would love it if it was just totally dead like i yeah i think to me it's it's very old school and like kind of with professional wrestling you can push so many boundaries of different matchups and and different characters and stuff like that so it doesn't it doesn't totally make sense to me to have like gender divisions anymore um so yeah i'm totally in support of it Dream match, who would you want to wrestle? Um, right now it'd probably be Hollow Wicked just because he was one of my main trainers. So, you know, I never got to have a, a, a match with him. So that's that's like top of mind right now. What do you think the next step is in wrestling as far as 
um, queer representation, queer shows, the blending of wrestling and queer culture together. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think the next steps are or what would you like those next steps to be? I really like that we have our showcase events. Um, I think those are really fun and I, I really love like that locker room experience and being able to like present that. And that's kind of what we're doing now. I'd love to see elements of that kind of blend into the rest of wrestling. So for those promotions now that generally just feature cis men or something like that, like something that's a little bit more traditional, bringing in these elements that, you know, we are doing on these kind of more queer showcase events. I'd love for there to be more like queer writers and queer creative types in the mainstream um, in WWE and AEW and, and stuff like that to bring those types of storylines that are, you know, sensitive and appropriate and realistic and all of that, you know, to be a part of mainstream wrestling and just to keep growing that. And hopefully like this current batch of, of queer wrestlers on the independents can, you know, move into that position someday. Tell me you're, you're really excited about wrestling at Effie's Big Gay Brunch. Um, I know that you're gonna be wrestling against Dark Sheik. That's gonna be dope. Kind of, I got a chance to like kind of pull Effie aside and, and tell him who I wanted to wrestle. And I, I picked uh, Dark Sheik. I've been wanting to wrestle her wrestle her for a long time. And she's actually one of the reasons I came out. So like, you know, in early, you know, I guess a year and a half ago, you know, I decided I was trans and I was ready to start transitioning and 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 doing that. And I wasn't sure what that like meant for me as like a wrestler, as a performer. Shortly after that, I found this video of her and she was coming out to everyone at Hood Slam and, you know, saying that she started hormones. So that just like gave me so much comfort in that moment that like, you know, if she can do that, then, you know, I can do this. And, you know, shortly after, like we, she invited me to perform. Um, and we became friends and, you know, we're still very close now. So like, um, you know, as of like this week, it's, I've been on, you know, hormones for one year. So um, this all kind of aligns really well together. So yeah, I'm just so excited to wrestle her and to like share that moment with her.